Okay, hi guys, thanks for joining us for this week's DDU teaching, which uh, by special request is on advanced diastology, and I put that in inverted comments because it's really just about difficult diastology. I don't know if it's more advanced or um, uh, whether I'll be able to shed some more light on it, it will just end up confusing everyone. But let's have a go. So just as a disclaimer, it's possible that none of this matters and that you should just go by your clinical judgment when you see your critically unwell patients, if they are behaving like somebody who has a severe diastolic dysfunction or significant diastolic dysfunction, then, then that's, that's what you, how you should be managing them. If you desperately need an echo to prove that, I think in my experience, um, that's usually because they have a fairly recent echo as an outpatient, say for example, and that showed no diastolic dysfunction. So nobody believes you or the cardiologists don't believe that this patient has um, uh, a significant in, uh, contribution from their diastolic dysfunction contributing to the clinical picture. That's been my experience. So if that is the case, then maybe it does matter. And there have been, the, there's pretty good evidence that diastolic dysfunction is linked to waning failure, mortality in ICU, um, combined with sepsis, people with sepsis get diastolic dysfunction. Um, and uh, I think that when people are critically unwell, what that does, it gives them a sort of diastolic stress test. So um, when at rest and under normal physiological conditions, they don't have any diastolic dysfunction, but when they're being stressed, their heart can't respond appropriately. And then you get this thing which, which is a real thing in an outpatient setting. Uh, you can come in for a diastolic stress test, but I think that happens with our ICU patients as well when their physiology is being challenged. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the parameters that we see. So I'm going to go through um, some of the, after the basic flow charts, which we've spoken about before, to diagnose diastolic dysfunction when they kind of don't work or special populations that are gone through in quite a bit of detail in these guidelines. But then I'll also talk about um, the, our more specific information to our population of critically unwell patients um, in the second half of the talk. And we'll do a case but briefly. So the first thing to mention is, um, your mild, moderate, severe diastolic dysfunction with special populations, that's not really going to be possible. You're going to be able to say they have it or they don't. And what they're actually saying is, they're not saying do they have diastolic dysfunction or they don't have diastolic dysfunction. They're saying do they have elevated filling pressures or not, which is, I guess, what you really want to know. Um, so what I'm not going to talk about is... Um, a, a special measure that's referred to a lot in the guidelines about the duration between the onset of your, between the E wave and the e, onset of the E prime. I think that's just too difficult for us to measure. And uh, I think when you get into these millisecond durations, uh, you need sort of like simultaneous measures. It's very, very difficult. So I'm not gonna talk about that specific measure, um, which is only mentioned for these um, special populations. Uh, what I'm going to talk, to talk about is filling pressures. Is it elevated or is it normal? And that relates to poor outcomes in our populations, in all populations really. Okay, so this is the second algorithm that you go straight to if your patient has a low ejection fraction, systolic dysfunction, or um, uh, cardiac hypertrophy, and also you're supposed to go straight to this if they have skin and heart disease or diabetes or some other reason that would predispose them to diastolic dysfunction. Um, the things I always like to point out about this flow diagram is that um, as you go down the, on the left side of the screen, the, the only, the lowest possible form of diastolic grading is mild dysfunction. So there's no option to say that there's normal Diastolic dysfunction, diastolic function. So, it, when you go straight to this algorithm, you commit your patient to having some level of dysfunction. But 
what's good about this, it, it clearly tells you that you only get raised filling pressures once you have moderate or more. So a grade one or a mild diastolic dysfunction has normal filling pressures and after that they go up. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through all the special populations. Is there anything, any questions so far about what I've talked about? Is that all making sense? Other than I think you're absolutely right that we're not sure if it all makes sense. <laughs> I think it's I think that's a nice nice bit. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, so in special populations, so what, what what do I mean when I say special populations? So people who have um, a structural abnormality when they have flutter, uh, f sorry, atrial fibrillation or flutter, and you can't really go down the pathway and look at their ENA ratios. You can't, um, people with restrictive cardiomyopathies, people with um, a, a mitral disorders where the traditional, like the normal measurements, which is only four things, so you're, you're your E um, velocity on your mitral inflow, your tissue Doppler, Doppler E prime, um, your TR jet gradient, and your um, left atrial size. So those things in, in the usual configuration aren't very useful. Well, they, there are problems with that. So the good thing is that your TR jet is generally reliable. So if that's raised, if it's more than 2.8, then um, uh, presuming that they don't have any primary respiratory disease that would be causing pulmonary hypertension, then you can probably say, oh, well, they've got pulmonary hypertension for no reason, it must be cardiac. That's kind of the, the reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, um, uh, yeah, so that's presuming that they're, they're, I think in our population as well, that might be a little bit, difficult because there is often concurrent disease. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't know why it doesn't go back. So, um, okay, so left atrial size becomes unreliable in many disease states. So we all know that um, tachycardia is atrial fibrillation, flutter, any mitral valve disease or be stenosis or regurg um, can cause an increase in your left atrial size, heart failure, heart transplant. So in all these populations, you can't rely on the left atrial size. And I've sort of put high acuity there because it's not mentioned in the guidelines, but I think if it's hyperacute, like you see in our pack, in our patient population, then the LA may not have had time to dilate in response to the diastolic dysfunction that you're seeing or the raised filling pressures that you're seeing. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, generally you can use the same algorithm. Um, when you have a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with more than a moderate MR, your AR minus A duration in your TR jet is the most reliable. So you don't you don't need to go down the usual algorithm. You can look at those things. Um, and if they're elevated, then um, they have raised filling pressures. Again, you can't grade the diastolic dysfunction. And then with restrictive cardiomyopathy, as the disease process progresses, their diastolic dysfunction progresses, and they have a pr pretty characteristic set of parameters to do with their um, uh, relaxation or lack thereof um, in the EA greater than 2.5 the deceleration time less than 150 so that's your deceleration time on your mitral inflow E wave your intraventricular relaxation time um, is very short um, and you have a, a proportionally low low medial and mitral E prime and what's pretty important to remember about that is that they both decrease. Your lateral is still higher than your medial, which is, which is normal, but they both go down. Um, and that's different to constrictive pericarditis where you get this inversion of the medial and lateral E prime. So then your, your medial becomes higher. Um, and again, as per the usual algorithm, you can use the E over E prime of greater than 14 but the LA volume cutoff is higher. So there's some um, things you can use. Uh, 
And this is from the Mayo Clinic. This is the pathway I touched on it previously in my talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy, but just to differentiate constricted pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy because they can both present with advanced um, diastolic dysfunction. And this is a big exam. This is a great exam question. People really like this in both, I think, DEU and the um, uh, North American exam. The cardiac myopathy, the amyloid cardiomyopathy, presents with this target type um, cherry on top uh, strain pattern where you have a spared um, apical contraction. So the good good contraction at the apex and then everything around it is, is impaired. And as you can see on the um, tissue dopplers in the two bottom panels, there's a low E prime for both medial and lateral. Um, and on the top left panel, you see that that E over A, the A wave is tiny there. So that E over A is definitely more than 2.5. So um, other people that is pretty challenging. Um, so we spoke, spoke previously a little bit about um, how if, if you have some of the markers for diastolic dysfunction, you will also get abnormal readings for the, for like your, your pump, you'll get pulmonary hypertension, you get LA enlargement when you have mitral valve disease as well. And how do you tell how much of it's from the diastolic dysfunction, how much of it's from the mitral valve disease? Um, in short, you can't really. There's not a really a great, great reliable method. Um, so your E over E prime, which is probably, I think, the, the, the easiest measure and the, you're kind of like the go-to measure to, to, to screen people, isn't useful because that annulus isn't moving normally when they have... Um, uh, like, a, like a prosthetic mitral valve, for example, and their E wave is artificially high because they have artificially high flows um, through prosthetic mitral valves or through um, mitral stenosis or um, uh, what are some other, maybe I'll ask this question just as a, like a side trivia thing. Um, Hassan, do you want to tell me what are some of the other causes of LV inflow obstruction? So left ventricular inflow obstruction could happen from uh, uh, something like hokum, uh, severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, can happen from uh, big thrombus or mass. So yeah. LV inflow, not outflow. Inflow, okay. Inflow obstruction. So think. Along mm -hmm. the same lines of mitral stenosis, what else? What else will obstruct? The info, uh, probably if there is any big uh, mass across the... the yeah, mitral. exactly, yep. So anything yeah. from exoma, echinoxoma, infective endothelitis with big vegetation that would block the, the pathway. Uh, yep. Yep, stenosis, congenital mitral stenosis. Congenital, yep. Um, and then... Um, when you have a septation across your atrium called core triatriatum, where it kind of, I hope I pronounced that properly, but, but, but that's um, it's not that uncommon actually, but it's still pretty um, uncommon. Yep. Where you have three, it looks like three atrium, but it's really just have a septation across one of your atria, and it looks like you have three atria. So usually there's a communication between the two sides across the septation. Um, and that can be very narrow, and that will cause LV inflow obstruction as well. Um, so some things that you can use in these populations is a short intraventricular relaxation time or really high E-wave velocities. Again, it just gives you an indication that they might have LV filling pressures. You're not going to get a clear grading out of it. Um, and it's similar for mitral annular calcification because the, the calcification around the mitral annulus kind of anchors the mitral annulus. So your E wave goes down artificially. So it's not reflecting the relaxation of the LV. And 
at the same time, calcification can narrow the, um, the orifice of the, of the mitral valve. So you get a higher E wave. So your E wave is really high, your E prime goes down. So your E over E prime ratio is really high. So it looks, it looks like they would have diastolic dysfunction, but not necessarily, because it's just a function of the mitral calcification. Then if you a large atrial septal defect, could that look similar to LV inflow obstruction? No, because if you have an atrial septal defect in the, um, yeah, it, that, that actually is like a off, what do you call it? Like a pop off valve. So it, you, because your left sided pressures are for most of the cardiac cycle higher than the right. So in the left atrium would decompress over to the right. Um, do you mean as in like they're not going to get as much filling as the LV? Yeah, basically, I was wondering if you, if you effectively lose flow, kind of like it's an underfilled state, in, you know, in a very contained environment, because you're going to lose blood into the right heart as opposed to putting down into left ventricle. Yeah, 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 that, absolutely. But um, I guess with um, when the when we talk about inflow obstruction, we we mean without yeah, wouldn't be obstruction it would yeah be. it wouldn't be yeah exactly yeah so because um I, I think the hemodynamics that you're trying to measure trying to demonstrate there well, what we're talking about there is you have the whole the blood volume being squeezed through mm. a small orifice yeah. yeah so and that would artificially in all of those disease systems artificially raise your e wave velocity so yeah and that's a very it demonstrates how preload dependent that measure is as well um and yeah so in in and in mitral regurge whether it's primary or secondary or both because if you have um if you have dilation of your left ventricle and then you have a, a secondary mr um and you have raised left like a large left ventricle, you, you basically you can't tell. Like you can't tell a chicken or egg or um, what's which one's contributing how much to each diagnosis. Um, again, the AR minus A duration might be helpful. That's again um, something that you can use to indicate raised filling pressures. So thirty seconds is the thirty milliseconds is a cutoff for that. And um, if only if the ejection fractions abnormal, can you use the E over E prime for some reason? But if it's normal, you can't use it. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, these are all. Um, so I've mentioned the AR minus A duration a couple of times now. So again, all of this becomes very difficult if they're an AF. So if you have concurrent AF and MR, which is not uncommon, or um, a cardio, uh, a restrictive cardiomyopathy and AF, then you can't, as usual, AF kind of ruins everything. Um, so this is just to show uh, on the right what, how to measure intraventricular realization time. So there's two ways. There's one where you put your um, Doppler line in your equal four chamber view and you try and overlap the, the um, mitral and aortic signals and then measure the time in between from the end of the aortic signal to the beginning of the mitral. Um, and then the other way is using the tissue Doppler which um, you can do from the end of your S wave to the beginning of the E wave. Um, and then on the left, the arrows are pointing to some diastolic MR, which is another indicator of raised left ventricular filling pressures. Um, yeah, so there's the, the main things that I wanted to, to show. Can, can you guys all see that? So, um, 
more special populations, so AS, as per usual, don't have to change anything. When you have severe atrial regurg, um, you can expect raised filling pressures. Um, and some of the other things that you can look for are diastolic MR and um, premature closure of the mitral valve. And with um, a stromal basal segment regional wall motion abnormalities invalidate the E prime that you get in that region. And it is normal to have, um, it's actually normal for the LV to become stiffer as you age. So a lot of elderly populations um, will get a diagnosis of mild diastolic dysfunction, but actually it's normal for them and it's kind of expected. Okay, so AF. AF, there's a few things you can use. Um, I think I've mentioned before that there's, you, when you look at the, the E wave, um, there's less variability. So just like with your VTIs, when you trace your VTIs and you have to do mo multiple, about five, to get a, 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 an accurate reflection, because in AF, every beat varies beat to beat. What you actually find in if they have raised filling pressures is there's less variability. So it would be, look quite consistent, the velocities, and you won't have like some small, some big waves. I have an example of that later. Um, and then there are actually specific cutoffs for diastolic dysfunction in AF if you can measure them. So um, your deceleration time again, less than 160, your very high E wave velocity, a short interventricular relaxation time, and your E over E prime doesn't need to get to 14, just 11 would indicate. Again, it just says whether they have it or they don't, you can't have a grade. Um, I guess the, the caveat with that is, because there's a caveat with everything, you have to, they, they recommend you measure 10 beats. 10 beats of AF, which I think is pretty impractical in our populations to get it really, to get the, the, the accurate um, uh, yeah, measurements. And they say, oh, you can use non-consecutive beats if you um, if the RR intervals are similar, but I, I mean I'm not going to like sit there and look at the RR intervals either. So I, I, that's I think a significant limitation there as well. Um, and any sort of conduction um, abnormality, so AV block, left bundle branch block, RV pacing, um, tachycardia as well. Uh, what that causes is EA fusion. And then it means that you can't reliably, your E wave becomes unreliable because some of the filling that was supposed to be reflected in your E wave is actually gets transferred over to the A wave. So your A wave looks bigger than it should and your E wave looks smaller than it should and your deceleration time is messed up. So you, you, when they're fused, you can't do it. So what they say is if it's fused, but that point where they're fused, and I'll show you an example later, is less than 20 centimeters per second, then that's still reliable. But if it's fused more than that, then, you, then there's too much merging of the waves. Um, you can still use your TR jet. And for some reason, um, I think it's because of the synchrony or dyssynchrony of the ventricular contraction. Even though you, you know, your left bundle branch block is going to mess up your diastolic measures, your right bundle branch block doesn't, and your anterior and posterior fascicular blocks don't either. So <laughs> I don't, yeah, it's interesting. Um, okay, so this I thought was interesting. So this is a picture of flutter waves. So you have your E wave, this one. And then you have flutter waves. And here again, there's a demonstrating diastolic MR, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, so that would be, because you can see diastolic MR there, you can say pretty with confidence, this person has raised filling pressures. Um, okay, so on the first panel here, so this is in AF, all of these measures, this person had an L wave so I, I think I mentioned this, I mentioned this before, but um, it, your L wave is um, and it's an extra wave. If there are sinus that happens between the E and the A, you, it looks like this is a good example. 
it looks like an extra kind of hill off the e-wave and you can measure that um, that's a pretty good sign of diastolic dysfunction if it's above 40 centimeters per second um, and that means they have at least a grade two diastolic dysfunction so you can say with confidence they have raised filling pressures why why does that happen because when when you have your your ventricular filling you have your e-wave then when it's supposed to equalize it's supposed to be equal so your e-wave is supposed to come back down to baseline but it's not because your left atrial pressures are high then there's ongoing forward flow into your ventricle and that gives you the l wave so that's where that comes from um, and you can still use an AF, the TR jet, as we mentioned, and um, they're just showing us that the E prime is low. So your E over E prime would be more than 11. And this is the example of the fused EA that I mentioned earlier. So you have um, that, that fusion sort of sitting up is well above 20 centimeters per second. So this is not a reliable um, uh, inflow Doppler. You can, um, by the way, tachycardia and causing fusion of EA in echo land is, um, and invalidating some of your mitral measurements is 80 or more, not 100 or more. So yeah, so most of these measurements are only really valid between high rates of like 60 to 80. Uh, so you, what you could do is just redo it when the heart rate's better if, if you can. Um, that would probably give you a, a more accurate measurement. And again, this is showing um, ENA wave fusion. Um, and how um, yeah, it just, it just becomes unreliable because it cuts off the wave. Okay, so I've got a case that maybe we can go through. Um, wait. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's not looping. Let me see if I can make a loop. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so who wants to comment on this? Um, ben, maybe I'll Oh, have some, you want to do it? So this is a short, uh, uh, parcel, a short axis cut across the mitral valve. Yep. And this is showing uh, concentric left intake and hypertrophy uh, with sort of normal uh, or maybe even hyperdynamic cardiac function. Yeah, I think it's pretty normal. And what about the rhythm? The rhythm here is an interfibrillation. And they're a bit fast. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, heart rate is 116. Okay, so what do we think of the deceleration time then? So here the deceleration time is quite uh, short. Hmm? Um, Sorry. No. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, the searching time is quite short and this denotes uh, uh, some element of that cell dysfunction. More likely it would be great to that cell dysfunction at least. What do you think of the quality of the image? The quality is not the best and again it needs to be averaged uh, given that this is an interfibrillation. So multiple, uh, multiple waves needs to be checked and uh, then after getting the average out of it. Mm. So the, and the RR intervals are quite different here. I mean, like, without measuring them, this is very short and this is very long and this is short again. So it's going to impact the E-wave um, velocities at least. Yeah. Okay. Good. And um, Ben, do you want to tell me about this comment on, on, the, on this image? Oh, sorry. Well, again, just looking at the rhythm to start with, they're either in, it looks like 
AF or it's a, they've got a type two block, I can't quite tell from the, what I can see. Yeah, it's AF, yeah. AF, yeah. So of what you said before, then we should probably have more beats, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, I the variability between the two beats is significant, I would have thought. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't know where, I guess, I'll ask for help. Well, I think um, this, I don't, I don't know why this number two measurement's here. Like this is not even a, a very clear wave. I mean, I would have measured this one, yeah. maybe yeah. this one, but I mean, it's, and can you see how it's brought the whole average down? Cause you have a 0.59 in there and you have a 0.9 and a 0.85 and like above, 0.8 or so is you can say that's like a high e velocity, but then you have a 0.59 there, and it's kind of confusing. So I, I think the quality of and of the pulse wave is not great um, for every beat, and then what's been selected to be measured is not um, good either. <clears throat> and then um, Marcus, do you want to tell me what we're looking at here? So looks like the patient's also in AF, got mm -hmm. quite regular RR intervals. And uh, since we're not expecting A waves, uh, that probably reflects an L wave then after the E. So this is the tissue. Oh, sorry, the, sorry. So this, this, is tissue, tissue. This, is, uh, this is tissue double, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we'll be looking at um, this E prime here. This is your yeah. E prime wave. And then this, if they were in sinus, would be an A wave, but they're not in sinus. Yeah. So I don't know what that is. It's just. So this. you're looking at the isovolumetric relaxation time there. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite, quite short, by the yeah. way. So we have the S wave that comes down to the baseline here. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not the best quality. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, and then you only have your E waves. So from where it comes down to the baseline to there. So you have your intraventricular relaxation time. Mm -hmm. um, and if we had an A wave, you could even on these, you could look at the interventricular contraction time, the other one. <laughs> so um, this is the other way of doing it. So, and it is quite short. Okay, so, um, and here's our TR jet for the same patient. So, a late, uh, late peaking signals are pretty good. I think they're measured well um, where they're supposed to be measured and sweep rates, uh, it's okay. You're measuring three of them and your average TR comes out with, I don't know, probably somewhere around three. Yep. I think that's good and they probably, so it's more than 2.8, probably should have technically done a couple more, but we can see that that's wouldn't, probably wouldn't have changed the result very much. Okay, so, so, so this is all the same patient. So if we go back to, um, so what we have, we have uh, your TR jet, which is raised of short interventricular relaxation time deceleration so your deceleration time which is probably about 90 on average but should have really should have done more beats and an e wave velocity that's not that high and if you work out the e over e prime it's nowhere near 11. Mm. so if i go back to af so we've got um a deceleration time of less than 160. Um, your E wave is not that high, nowhere near that high. Your intraventricular relaxation time is short, but your ENA prime is not over 11. Hmm. So half of our measures say this person does have raised feeling pressures, and half of our measures say they don't. And the reason why I chose this case was not to be a jerk, but just to say how difficult it is, even though you have these parameters. Um, supposedly you say, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, I'll like go measure that. And then you still don't get a clear answer. Mm. So I think the actual issue here is not that 
um, this patient doesn't, this patient somehow exists on a, a plane of, you know, an alternate reality where they have simultaneously raised and normal feeling pressures. I think that the problem here is the measurements that have happened, that the measurements weren't actually reliable. Um, yeah, so that's just to demonstrate that you need to take measurements. <laughs> and then this is from the guidelines. This is just a table uh, summarizing the special populations that we talked about and the kind of values that you can look for. So this is in the guidelines. You can just Google it, it's free, download it, whatever, or have, have the table in your pocket. Um, if, if you challenge, and I find most frequently for, for me, the challenge is AF. Um, and often these people are in heart failure and we, you sort of need a, um, a little bit of a indication as to what is causing the heart failure. And then, okay, so more specifically to the, our own population. There are a few papers I found, no, but by no means is this an exhaustive literature search, but there are a few papers that look at diastolic dysfunction in the critical ill population. And, and the unifying theme is that they all basically criticize the, the current guidelines because the measurements are kind of impractical, like the, the volume measurements of the LA, which requires like a biplane of Simpson's method of the left atrium, essentially. Mm. It's quite hard to get all those views, um, especially to do it accurately. And then body surface area is required. So, um, and they also, our patients also have multiple confounders, often have respiratory disease or they're on a ventilator and that can raise their vascular resistance and give you um, a, a high high TR jet. So um, it, they kind of criticize the, the guidelines. The guidelines and uh, all those values were uh, elucidated in like a normal outpatient cardiology population. So they're not really for our population anyway. Um, so this paper, what they suggest is just um, do a more uh, qualitative measurement of the LA volume. So just eyeball it basically, or measure it on your parasternal in M mode, which, you know, the, the ideally you wouldn't do, but if that's all you can do. Um, they also mentioned that um, uh, uh, like because the algorithm, the original diastolic algorithm tells you to get the average of the lateral and the septal E prime on your tissue dopula. The, you know, they say, why do you need both? Uh, why don't you just do one or the other? And there are actually cutoffs if you only have one or the other. So if you only have, I hope I get this right, round, right uh, around the right way. Um, if you only have a medial, you can use a cutoff of, 15, and if you only have a lateral, you can use a cutoff of 12, not 14, of, as your E over E prime ratio. So just do one or the other, because it's going to be hard enough to get accurate measurements. Um, and they also, um, the, the, in the guidelines, they also suggest doing Valsalva maneuvers and diameter maneuvers, and they're saying that that's, to, that's not really practical for our patient population. In general, for critically unwell patients, um, uh, the E over the E prime seems to be the, the, the most reliable measurement um, outside of the special populations that I mentioned here. So I think that's probably the best one. So if you can get an E over E prime, um, uh, and if it's higher than 11 in AF or uh, higher than 14, if you have an average or higher than, I think it was 12 or 15 medial or lateral, then you can <clears throat> say that this person has diastolic dysfunction and, and raised filling pressures. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's what these guys say. And they quoted multiple studies that show that the E over E prime is a pretty reliable indicator of diastolic dysfunction and therefore worse outcomes. Um, and none of the studies found LA volume to be helpful. <laughs> so, um, okay, uh, are there any questions about what I've just mentioned? There's a few more papers. 
Any clinical situations or circumstances where the interatrial septum or the pulmonary vein flows could be useful? I know that. Yes, so, um, the, well, they say it's useful in that, you know, if your uh, intraatrial septum is bowed um, to, towards the right, then that's going to be an indicator of raised left atrial filling pressure, provided you have some indication of what the right atrial pressure is. Mm -hmm. So if you have a central line in um, and a CVP uh, uh, with all the caveats of that, but mm -hmm. um, if you have that in and you're... Your, it's not huge, and you can say that your left atrial pressure is more than that because it's persistently bowed throughout the whole cardiac cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use that, and then the pulmonary vein flows. Um, yes, there there is mention of those. I guess I'm a little bit biased because I think the pulmonary vein one is quite hard to get in our patient population, and uh, on a transthoracic that is. Um, but the other thing is you can predict what the pulmonary vein flow is going to be because the D wave mimics what the E wave does on your mitral inflow. Mm. So if you're, yeah, so you can kind of predict what it's going to be. So I, I, I don't really use it. Um, does anybody else have any comments about that? Yeah, they, they mentioned it like in the guidelines as well. They had measures of like the deceleration time of the D wave of the pulmonary vein. I'm like, that's, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, that's a bit, that's too much. <laughs> All right. um, so I just <laughs> ignored that. Um, and uh, so there's a, another patient, uh, another paper here um, in the critically ill population. And their key points were here. So again, like just reiterate, why do we care? Because it is associated with worse outcomes. And they also found that this decreased E wave and a higher E over E prime ratio is a good indicator of um, LV diastolic dysfunction. And they found that it was associated with mortality and severe sepsis. Okay, so there's another paper by some guy called Dr. Borde. I don't know if you know him, but um, <laughs> so this group of very intelligent people um, had an interesting criticism, which um, of the guidelines, which I hadn't thought about actually, is that um, in critically ill patients, your diastolic dysfunction doesn't necessarily equate to raised filling pressures and raised filling pressures should be unmarried from that diagnosis because you can have normal LV relaxation say but still have raised filling pressures based on like their fluid status for example and things are very dynamic in um in ICU um and what else did they mention Yeah, and uh, sort of similar to, to what I've already, what, what the other papers have um, mentioned as well, um, predicts mortality and, um, yeah. That's it. Um, really just a quick question. Uh, so that all applies within, for the patient that had got normal systolic function. So what about the patients with systolic dysfunction? Would we consider all of them to have some diastolic uh, failure? element as well uh what sorry what, what do you mean was what do you mean by the first part of your question so which so so for whatever measurements that we are doing and the number that we are getting this mostly applies for the patients with normal systolic function mm -hmm. so, yeah so, some of it does some of it doesn't yeah, yeah. so what about patients with a systolic dysfunction would they all be considered having some element of diastolic failure as part of the, their systolic dysfunction I mean, technically, yeah, because the, like the lowest, because you 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 have you according to the guidelines, you have to go to that second algorithm, which which is the first picture I showed you, and the lowest form of diastolic function you can have is mild dysfunction. So 
yeah, I, I think they're all kind of committed to having some sort of diastolic dysfunction. I guess you could say, like, if you if your contraction's impaired, then your relaxation you must be at least a little bit impaired, I guess, is the logic there. But, um, uh, yeah, so there, that's kind of what, what has to apply. And then some of the, the special population measurements that I went through is specific to abnormal EF or, or normal EF as delineated there. Yeah, it's very, it's not easy. It's very complicated. I find this very, very difficult and um, very confusing, which is why, you know, I started with take the clinical picture into account. Um, if it's not relevant to the clinical picture, then don't bother because it's very difficult to get some of these measurements and you can end up just uh, getting contradictory measurements like we saw there. So and it's just a waste of your time. But if it is important to the clinical picture or the diagnosis or for, for uh, pro prognostication, then yeah, it, these are some things that you can use to help you. And I think, yeah. Um, so again, a uh, similar sort of paper. So basically, reiterating some of the points that I had already mentioned in the critically ill population. And just a final note about reporting. So when you put, when you want to talk about this, um, they suggest that you, if you can grade it, grade it. And there's one or mild, two or moderate, three or severe. And then make a comment about feeling pressure. So if it's grade two or more, then you sort of say uh, moderate diastolic dysfunction with raised feeling pressures. And I put a little asterisk there about acuity because again, that's just in the sort of normal outpatient population. I don't, it's, I think doing it in, in the critically ill population is a bit of a minefield because if they have a very high acuity of, um, diastolic heart failure and their left atrium hasn't had time to expand, then, then it's going to be very confusing in terms of your measurements. And also compare with previous, if you have a previous echo, like you would, uh, like you always would when you're reporting the results of your echoes, um, any interval changes should be noted. And that's all I have to say about that. Are there any, um, any questions? Thank you so much, Benny, about that. It's really very comprehensive and amazing talk. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, it's not very... Uh, I really like it when somebody spoon feeds you and just tells you what to do and gives you a very simple... And I couldn't do that in this case, so I, I apologise. It's quite complicated and there's like 50 different numbers to remember, which I'm sure nobody will remember. But um, if you do need to refer to something, there, there, uh, there are parameters that exist, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay, Phil, well, thanks for joining, guys. Thanks for my end. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.